As we open to the third psalm, and if you want to turn there with me, I want to take the time to, to explain that uh, God knows we need this psalm. Because the most repeated command in the Bible, in the negative sense, is fear not. We as people are much like sheep. We're very fearful creatures. And David has distressing news coming to him. And yet, we'll see in the psalm that he is able to just lay down in the presence of all of his fears and go to sleep. Now think about the last time you heard from the doctor that you had cancer or you needed some open heart surgery or you were just fired or were going to be fired the next day or you had to go in and see the IRS for something that possibly will cost you tens of thousands of dollars. Did you sleep well? the night before? Most humans don't. They can't sleep because fear robs us of the ability to absolutely relax and trust. And, and this psalm is about David who learned to sleep when fears were staring him in the face. It's a wonderful, wonderful lesson to learn. But as we open the third psalm, just look down at the part before the first verse. Now, if you don't have a Bible that has the part before the first verse, you should really think about your Bible because that's the first verse in the Hebrew manuscript. It's the little superscript uh, that says something like a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. That's a part of the Bible. And, and it's part of all of the Hebrew manuscripts. But what we don't know is uh, whether or not that part was attached to the psalm before or the psalm that follows. And so that's why some versions leave it out. But uh, this clearly has to do with the third psalm. Uh, because the Bible was written in manuscripts that were uh, just nonstop with, with no pagination and no Psalm 3 or whatever, they're just one after another, this little superscript, it's called, uh, is float sometime between psalms. But this one, it's dead on and goes there. But as you look down at that, uh, there's some observations we can make by looking at that. Number one, this is the first psalm that's called a psalm. The, the part in your Bible that says Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3 isn't in the Bible. They just did that to help you find things. But this little superscript is in the Bible. It was inspired by God, and it's a psalm of David. So this is the very first psalm in the Bible called a psalm. Now the rest are psalms. This one's the first one that actually is called a psalm. Secondly, if you look down at that, this is the first psalm in the whole Bible attributed to David. Isn't that interesting? It's the first one that says it's a psalm of David. Now there's going to be 72 more as you go through the 150 psalms, but this is the very first one in the book of Psalms attributed to David. Thirdly, this is the first time that we see the usage of the emphasis uh, device. That's that word selah. It's right at the end of verse 2, it's right at the end of verse 4, and it's right at the end of the psalm. So this is the first time that we have this sila. It shows up 68 more times in 38 other psalms, but this is the first psalm that has it present. And finally, if you look at the rest of that little superscript, this is the very first inspired setting for any psalm. That's why we'll spend time this evening looking at the setting. Because it says in the rest of that superscript, a psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. Wow. So that divine title, background, setting, tells us that this is a message from God for how to deal with fear. That's why he put this little tag on here, because if we didn't have that little tag, this psalm would be just like all the other psalms. You wonder what's going on and why that particular thing is being sung about. But this psalm is a psalm about David fleeing for his life, pursued by his own son in one of the most fearful and sad times in his life. And it becomes a rich source of how to learn to sleep when fears are completely surrounding us. It, it, that's why God, I believe, put the little tag on the front of it, because he knew we're fearful creatures, and we need lessons. 
Well, the biblical setting for this psalm is found in 2 Samuel 15. So, if you haven't yet uh, marked that, because I've alluded to it several times, you ought to grab your pen, pull it out, and just write somewhere by Psalm 3, and especially by that little superscript, write 2 Samuel 15, 30 to 32. Because that's the backdrop for this psalm. And if you want to remember this lesson, in fact, if you ever do get a notice from the IRS that, you know, or they think that you owe on a several hundred thousand dollars of income you don't think you had, or if you ever do get a notice that you have to appear in court for something you didn't do, or if you do get that blood test that says that the doctor needs to talk to you and you can't sleep, you ought to pull out this third psalm and, and say, ah, I should be able to sleep when fear surrounds me. Because God gave a lesson through David of what to do the next time fear is just looking me straight in the eye. And, and even sleep is a reflection of trust. And I need to learn to trust and know that God has taken care of me. Well, now that we have all that, back up to 2 Samuel 15. Because I want to read the backdrop before we go into the psalm. Because if God thought that the setting was so important that he gives us the very first psalm that is called a psalm and the first psalm of David and the first psalm that has emphasis, those selahs in it. And he adds to all that that this is the first psalm that has an inspired historic backdrop. Then he wants us to remember that historic inspired backdrop. So in 2 Samuel 15, verses 30 to 32, this is, and, and in a moment I'm going to read it with you, this is what needs to be just, just in technicolor in front of us as we read the psalm. Because if you can see, if you can feel, if, if you can just get a, get a complete sense of, of what's going on around David as he writes this, then every word of the third psalm is completely impacting our life. And we'll learn kind of the lesson that David learned. And so that when fear does steer us in the face, we can have the same peace that he had. 2 Samuel 15, verses 30 to 32. Now that you're there, let's all stand together. And standing will help us, because it alters our, our normal pattern, it helps us remember more. And it's also out of respect for God's word. And let's listen to the Lord speak to us. 2 Samuel 15, 30. So, David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up. And he had his head covered, and he went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went up. Now that is a very graphic picture. Verse 31, and someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray Turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Verse 32. Now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God. That's really where I believe this psalm was given to his heart. Now, I don't think he wrote it right there. He couldn't have. He was barefooted, crying, bleary-eyed, <coughs> surrounded by crying people and all the other stuff we saw last time. But there is where David paused in his tears, surrounded by his fears, and he worshiped God. Amazing. What a blessing. Let's bow together. Father, I pray that us who you tell so many times to fear not, to us who your most often repeated negative prohibition recorded in the Bible is for us to stop fearing. You do not operate in the realm of fear. That's the devil's realm. You do not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so the devil finds access and entry and grounds for defeating and debilitating and, and totally getting us off course when we are afraid. And so I pray that like David, when we're afraid, we'll trust in you. And we'll use every one of our fears as a springboard into faith and trust in you. And then maybe the devil will quit sending us so many. And maybe that we will learn by habit 
to face our fears and to trust in you, O God. And so we ask you to illumine our hearts and make this passage, O Spirit of God, more alive in our hearts and minds and from your word than we have ever seen it before so that we can deeply learn this lesson. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I want you now to, with me, think about how we got here. Do you remember every, every passage of Scripture cannot be taken in a vacuum? Every passage of Scripture has it's a background to it. And the third Psalm and 2 Samuel 15 that we're reading from are all a part of our examination of the consequences to David's sin with Bathsheba. This event was one event but there are many consequences to the one event. David finds out that after five years of relative calm, and, and if just back up to chapter 13, okay, of 2 Samuel, because I'm going to summarize each of the chapters leading up here in about 15 seconds. First of all, here's a summary of 2 Samuel 13. David finds out that after five years of relative calm, under the surface, trouble has been brewing. Ammon's raping his half-sister Tamar uh, led her full brother Absalom to murderously plot against and then kill Ammon, David's oldest son. That's the 13th chapter. And so, you know, there's this little blip in the, in the family life, you know, a little, little quiet kept under the carpet, you know, raped by one half-brother of a half-sister, and the full brother starts seething. And so he murders his brother, and then five years pass, and kind of David thinks, oh, stuff's calmed down. Now, chapter 14, Absalom flees to his mother's hometown, the Sea of Galilee. He hides there. He stays away a total of five years, and then he's allowed to come home to Jerusalem, where he deceitfully appears to care about others. He steals the heart of the nation of Israel by being the king that the people can approach and pour out all their troubles on. That's the 14th chapter. Absalom comes back, and he's so, such a good actor. And he says, I'll be the king David never was. I have time for you. Come and, and, and he won't even let anybody bow. He just, he just reaches down and, and just shows this false humility. Well, then the true Absalom comes out, chapter 15. Absalom moves. He strikes out in treason as a usurper of David's throne. He gets some key allies to go along with him. David has to flee Jerusalem for his life. And that's where we find David walking, where we just read in verse 30 of chapter 15, barefooted and weeping, surrounded by head-covered, weeping people. That's the setting of this time. Psalm 3 is actually part of a pair of psalms. In fact, now we're going to read it, so why don't you turn with me to the third psalm, where we just were, but I want you to see the context. The third psalm is actually one of a pair of psalms that are so full of life application for us, because David wrote two psalms from his time of fear and running from Absalom. Even though David is fully restored in his relationship with God, David still has to learn about facing and dealing with the pain and fears that come from from personal attacks on your life. And nothing is more personal than your son attacking you. And so these lessons are captured by God for us in this psalm, Psalm 3, and in another psalm we're going to see next time, the 63rd psalm. Now, Psalm 3, we know this is uh, from Absalom, his son's coming, because it says it in that little superscript. It says the psalm of David when he fled from Absalom. The way we know Psalm 63 is from that time period is that in Psalm 63, David is called the king. And there he is also running, but he's running not as David the shepherd boy, not as David the one who, who was the son-in-law of the king, but he's called the king. And the only time David ran as king is right here. And so the 63rd Psalm also comes from this time period. But in the third Psalm, David is on the run for his life, but before we read it, I want you to think about the emotions that, that are surrounding David, and I want you to actually feel what life was like walking barefoot and weeping for fear, for your life, surrounded by every possible disaster that could befall you. So, so think with that, because basically, 
Absalom, after seeking to kill David, uh, causes David to flee from Jerusalem and go into the most defensible position he could find. And there David, out in the desert, is supposed to rest. That's kind of where we're going. That's why we're picking up with him, running out of the city, going down the hill of Jerusalem, across the Brook Kidron, up over the Mount of Olives, down the other side of the Mount of Olives, and out into the wilderness, where those mighty military men found some spot where they could be behind rocks with their bows and arrows and their spears and their swords and their slingshots, and they could have David protected in some very protected place, and they could be surrounding him and protecting him until they figured out where they could go to find more permanent safety. But this was just a quick one. And, and what we're going to see is how David worships God even through his tears. Remember, he paused on the top of the mountain and weeping, but worshiped God. So imagine with, with me the, the scene surrounding David that, that is described in 2 Samuel 15. First of all, Joab. Remember, Joab was with David. Do Joab is the commander-in-chief. He'd be like Mike Mullen, the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that I guess is flying over to Jordan this week to check out what's going on over there with Egypt. But imagine Joab, the commander-in-chief of all of David's armies. What was Joab doing? While David was walking barefoot and finding this little spot to cry and rest after fleeing his home. But Joab was undoubtedly working feverishly in his preparation to protect David. Guards were immediately posted around David as they stopped. Troops were stationed, grouping by grouping, to fend off any attack. Concentric rings of defenses were planned and prepared so that those 600 seasoned soldiers who marched out with David were arrayed to face any army or any group of enemies that might attack on this first very vulnerable night. See, they just had the stuff they carried on their backs and in their hands, and they were camping in the desert, waiting for Absalom to come out with his armies against them. And so they did everything they could with the 600 men to, to get as defensive a position as possible so David could rest after this tumultuous time. Joab was worried that a frontal assault by Absalom's army would overwhelm his perimeter. He was tense. He was going back and forth to the camp. He considered maybe taking David deeper into the wilderness or maybe finding another spot. His head was spinning with all those thoughts, but he thought it was time to greet David and check on how he was doing. But as we'll see, instead of being rattled or despondent, David, in the midst of this horrible time, was actually in a time of experiencing God. Now think about that. That's the title of a book uh, by Henry Blackaby, but it's actually a very good thing to do, not just read about. David was having the ultimate time of experiencing God. Now think about it, because it's what's going to come out in the psalm. For the first time in hours, Joab got to see David all alone. And he immediately sensed something was completely different about David. Gone were his red, swollen eyes of the morning. Back were those clear, bright eyes he remembered from so many years of fighting alongside this giant of a man. Remember, Joab had been with David. He was one of the mighty men. He had, he had been with David before he was king. He had been with David through all those hiding in the cave things. Instead of anger and self-pity or fear, David was calm, peaceful, and actually visibly joyous as he began to tell Joab what the Lord had done in his heart. Incredulous, Joab smiled. He shook his head and hurried off to check the defensive positions once more, which was his job. When Joab returned again, he was struck with an even more amazing sight. He found David kneeling down on the ground in front of a rock he had a scroll laid out. And there was David, with pen and ink in hand, busily writing, just like Joab remembered from those days in the cave of Adullam. Those cave times were over a dozen years earlier. Now, how do we know it was a dozen years earlier? Because since David left the cave and went off and was marching into battle and sent away and Saul died, and then they came and anointed David as king, he had served seven years in Hebron, and five more years of this Absalom murder and waiting. So over a dozen years had been 
passed since Joab remembered David in the cave times. But he realized it was just like those earlier days when David wrote Psalm 57 and Psalm 142. Just like then, Joab remembered David's peace in those days of fleeing from King Saul, when David had also written Psalm 17 and 54 and 35 and 36 and 53 and 16 and 39. And now his king was added again. The psalm writing, that is. Once finished, David held up the scroll to the fading light of the evening sky. He read it over, quietly sang the words to a tune he just made up, rolled the scroll up, tied a cord around it, tucked it in his cloak. David had written another song. Only it wasn't just any song. It was a psalm. It's what we call Psalm 3. And he turned, unrolled his sleeping bag, laid down, and before Joab knew it, David was sound asleep on the ground. That's the setting of this psalm. David, in the very presence of his enemies, in the middle of the camp that could be overrun at any moment, David was sleeping. And Joab marveled again at what a person after God's own heart looks like. Because Joab had witnessed David's results of experiencing God. Where we decide to turn in our most desperate moments and how we face what we never wanted or dreamed of ever happening reveals what is really on the inside of us. And what came out of David at this excruciating time was a song that was so good God has forever recorded it in heaven. Now just the fact that in your Bible is this third song or third psalm means that it's a part of the forever recorded in heaven scriptures. You know, when I lived in California early on in ministry, Bonnie and I were newlyweds, we lived next door to a platinum record person. They had so many, pla I don't know how many you have sell to have platinum. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. But when we would visit our neighbor, in his living room were all of his platinum records that he had recorded and sold however many you have to sell to be platinum. And I thought about it. every time there was an earthquake, whether they all fell down and whether he put them all back up, you know? And I thought when, when someday the brush fires would burn his house, whether he would get replacements. You know, things are so transient in life for us. But David's song was better than any of today's topping the charts or billboards, gold or platinum. This is the exact record before us of the song that flowed from David. And now with that in mind, follow along in your Bibles. Look at the first verse because we've already looked at the superscript. And this is what David wrote from his heart at this moment we just thought about. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. And then he wrote the first sea lot which means pause and think about it for a moment. Verse 3, But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, the one who lifts up my head. I love that phrase, lifts up my head, because I can't look her up. I'm, I'm head down, weeping, covered like he was, walking. But while he was doing that, he found the Lord was the one who could lift his head up. And he talks about that. You are my glory, verse 3. The one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice. That's what he was doing with all that weeping and wailing and crying and all that. He was, he was crying to the Lord with his voice. Verse 4 says, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. You know what he's saying? Stop and think about that. I was just walking barefooted, covered head, crying. And I was crying to the Lord. And he heard me. See, the, this is so personal. Look at verse 5. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. 
For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. And for the third time, he says, Selah, stop. Think about that. Don't let it go by. The setting of this psalm is part of God's word. The line about fleeing from Absalom was written down to emphasize this was a lesson we all need to learn. That's why, actually, in Hebrew, if you're taking Hebrew class tonight in seminary, you would find in your manuscript that Psalm 3 has nine verses. Look at your Bible. How many do you have? You have eight and a superscript. They have nine, because verse 1 is that superscript. Because that was a lesson to emphasize that when fear stalks us, God says, fear not. That's his reminder to us. Psalm 3 is set in the context of battles. If you trace through the verses we just read, you'll find the setting to be mentioned seven different times. Did you notice it? Look back down. Look at verse 1. It says, David is facing foes, that's what the NIV says, adversaries, that's what the New American says, and, and those who rise up or trouble me is what the New King James says. But do you see that first verse? Look at verse 3. David says he needs a shield. He said, Lord, you're a shield. That's, that's a warfare metaphor. Verse 6, David saw them deployed as an army. He says, they are set against me. That's what the New King James and New American says. It, it, the word set in Hebrew means arrayed, and that's a battlefield. It's groupings, archers and spearmen. They're all arrayed out there. This is a, a battlefield. Uh, the NIV says, they're drawn up against me. Look at verse 7. David calls them enemies. That's how the New King James translates it. In verse 7, he says, O rise, O Lord. And that word arise is used, the actual formula from Numbers 10.35. In Numbers 10.35, when the children of Israel were going out into the, the uh, prom, or headed toward the promised land, Numbers tells them what they're supposed to do when they face their various enemies. And this very formula for going into battle is, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. And David pulls that out and puts it into his psalm because he sees he's in a battle. Look at verse 8. David spoke of armies. The word people in this verse is used for an army. It's the actual Hebrew word, the word peoples. It's actually armies. Uh, and finally, in verse 8, the seventh metaphor for a battle is uh, David sought victory is implied by the word deliverance. That's what the NIV says. And deliverance from the Lord is a war cry. He's saying, Lord, I want you to deliver me in this battle that I have entered. So seven different ways this psalm talks about a battle. But also Psalm 3 divides up the message God gave to David three into three little parts. That's the selah. It, it sets each stanza. The word selah means lift up. It's a musical term, uh, kind of like going toward a crescendo. It's, it's like, you know, if I was a musical director, I would be going like this, and then this is the crescendo, you know, and that's the selah. And, and it means crank it up or punctuate that with emphasis. In other words, David is saying, don't miss this point. And so that's why he put selah in. And so when you see the word selah, anywhere you're reading and all those times it occurs in the book of Psalms, God wants you to stop and ask yourself, did I catch that? What do you think about that important point? There's something there. And if you see a selah, back up until you see what it is that you're supposed to see at that point. So in verse 2, David says, Many are those who say of me, there is no help from him in God. Selah. It's kind of like a crescendo. It's like a boom of the orchestra. And it says, stop and consider. What do you think about that? Think about what? Well, David paused and thought about and found that he had a lifetime of definite proof that God cared for him. Many are they who say there's no help from him in God. And he says, wait a minute, stop and think about that. I have a whole lifetime of personal experience that God has cared for me and watched over me and provided and protected. And he stopped and he thought about it. And he says, there's many that are saying something that's not true. That's why the scriptures say, believe the truth. Don't believe the lies that the devil gives. Most of our fears are not true. They're lies. They're doubts. They're, they're not true. We're supposed to meditate on the truth. So David did. And the truth is, God has cared for him. In verse 4, look down at that. David said, I cried to the Lord with my voice, 
and he heard me from his holy hill. And there's that word selah. Crescendo, boom, stop. Think about this. Think about what? Well, David reflected on the steadfast hope and confident faith that God had rescued him in the past and would continue to do that. David said, wow. He heard me from his holy hill. He's rescued me every time in the past. He's heard me now. And even though I don't see Absalom taken care of, the Lord has become a shield about me. It's amazing how, how we can completely go from fear to peace by just believing truth about God. And that's what David does. And then finally, in verse 8, David said, Salvation belongs to the Lord. And ends the psalm with Selah. And, and he's saying, stop and think about that. Don't let that one go by you. David reflected on the truth that God alone can save us from all of our deepest trouble. And the use of Selah makes three clear <laughs> divisions for the message of this psalm. So let's look at that. Number one, the first two verses tell us that all of us, like David, are going to face battlefields. That's the message of verses one and two. David is reminding us we're all going to come into battlefields. Either going to school is going to be like a battle, and we're going to see everybody as bullying and picking on us, or going into the job is going to be like a battlefield. We look at everybody's younger than us, and we're going to be the next one cut. Or going into some medical facility, the people aren't going to care. Isn't it amazing that in America, the most prosperous nation in the world, the person that is closest to keeping your life, you know, going, the person on the other end of that emergency machine or the other end of that ambulance is probably paid just above minimum wage. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever thought about that? Those people, I was just recently in the hospital and had a little something done, and Bonnie looked up at the person doing it. And, you know, here I am connected to this machine, and they're doing all this, and she says, have you graduated from college? And he said, no, I went to the technical school for one year. And he said, and you're running this several hundred thousand dollar machine and, and it's all hooked up and my husband's blood is going through it. And they said, mm-hmm. And I thought, isn't it, isn't it amazing that in America we entrust our lives to machines and to people that don't make the hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars that doctors do. They just are, are normal people with normal education. You know, if, if you stop and think about it, you can go into a medical thing and start getting afraid. What if the person testing your blood and dripping it, what if they, you know, don't really know and they don't tell you? You know, and we can just, we can go to school to work and to the medical or into the financial field and you wonder if there's anybody on the other side of that electronic transfer. And we can just live in fear. And David said, no, we're all going to face battles. Every one of us will face a variety of battles daily. Whether it's the workplace, which is largely cutthroat these days, as more and more people compete for fewer and fewer jobs with less and less job security, we endure personal attacks and abuse, which is the norm in the workplace. Competition prompts the ungodly use of weapons such as lying and slander and gossip and misrepresentation and bribes and stealing and falsification and blame shifting, all for them to gain advancement. How many enemies does it take to make your life miserable? Just one if they're persistent, right? Just one person. And David says, we're all going to go through battles. Our battlefield may not be the workplace. It may be our home. Even though you and I will never face an army led by our son seeking to destroy us and our throne, we will someday face personal attacks or slander or abuse through the hatred of one of our children. They may betray us for what we stand for. They may even seek to undermine our family unity or discredit and destroy us as parents. You know, I, I said it on this side in first service and that side in second service. You know what? There's no greater joy than our children walking in the truth. And there's no greater pain than when they don't. No one can seemingly hurt us more than those closest to us. Those we beget, those we marry, and those we share our lives with, and those that are our very closest friends can hurt us most deeply. And that's what David felt. Some of us may have to deal with personal attacks and slander from a husband or a wife who's turned against us with no warning, deserted us, seeks to harm and torment us by breaking the lasting promise made in marriage. And others may face parents who turn against them, abandon them, are slanderous, abusive against their very own children. Life is hard. Sin is horrible. People seem more willing to harm others easily than ever before. And that's why David said, stop. 
and think about that. That's why at the end of verse 2, he says, Selah. He says, think about it. Life is like a battlefield. You never know where the next missile's coming from, the next deadly force is heading your way. That's what life is like. But he doesn't stop there. Look at verse 3. Second, David says, we all have to make choices. David was such a godly example because he turned his attention away from his problems and he focused on God. Suddenly, everything would be put into proper perspective. That's why we saw in 2 Samuel 15 that as soon as the first wave of, of more bad news came to David and they said, Ahithophel has deserted you and he's joined the enemy, David immediately prayed. That's why I think that the turning point for David was somewhere walking down the hill of Jerusalem and across the brook Kidron and up the hill. Somewhere in that period of time, his weeping and crying out to God, he connected. Because as soon as the, the second wave, the first wave was Absalom's coming, get out of town. And they're crying and walking barefoot and weeping and wailing. But when he gets to the top of the hill and they say, and he's got the most formidable advisor on earth, humanly speaking, with him. David said, Lord, another problem, I'm going to put it in your hands. See, like David, we all make choices. For example, because God had been a shield in the past for David, look what he says in verse 3. He said, Lord, you're a shield for me. He told the Lord, you're my glory. You're the one I want to please. You're the one worth living for. You're the one worth praising and honoring. By the way, even the word, if, if you look at verse 3, it's interesting. It's all caps. But you... O, and it's L-O-R-D, all in capitals. Did you notice that? That's the way they emphasize the two different Hebrew words for Lord. There's L, little O-R-D, and there's L, capital O-R-D. And the, this means that David used the name for the Lord, his covenant name, Yahweh. He's the covenant-keeping gods. He's the God who keeps his word. He's the one who makes promises that are never broken. And he says, you, Lord, you, Yahweh or Jehovah, you are the one who keeps your word. You bring to pass the promises you make. You be the shield around me. You always promised you'd be, and you always have been. See, it's interesting how David draws upon doctrinal truth. He had learned about God growing up. He had been taught about the ineffable name of the covenant-keeping God. And so he invokes that name and says, Promise keeper of all, be my shield. This exposed a spiritual secret that kept David going strong through his darkest hours. He knew and trusted the Lord. That's what I mean by experiencing God. You see, it's just like salvation. Many people in America today miss heaven by 18 inches. They know all about God. They've just never, in their heart, trusted him, called upon him personally. They just know the facts. They've never experienced God. That's the same truth that Paul was talking about. He says, as you receive the Lord, you walk in him. We receive the Lord by going from fact to faith. We walk in him by going from fact to experiencing it by faith. That's the secret David experienced. This trust had stayed constant with him long before his rule as king. So he reminded himself, the Lord can be trusted. Verse 3 ends with, you're the one that lifts up my head. Just like in the days when the Amalekites plundered David's house and stole his property and took his family hostage. You remember that was the darkest day of his life. That's in 1 Samuel 30. And he came home from, from work, and when he got over the top of the hill, he looked down, and everything that was important to him, his house, his family, everything he possessed, was all gone. The Amalekites had burned and pillaged and stolen everything. David had lost his wives, his children, and every possession. And in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, it says, David strengthened himself in the Lord. He didn't go to a counselor. He didn't go and buy a book. He didn't go to a therapy session. Just David and God had a little, little exchange. You know, in America, we, all, we, we just want to get it over with right away. And so we want to grasp after something outside. But when we are at the, the ultimate depths where there is nothing and no one that can comfort us, there's always one who stands closest. 
And David strengthened himself in the Lord. And verse 6 of 1 Samuel 30 says, his God. He experienced God. And you know, I'm, I'm not an a anti-medicine, anti-anything, you know, not anti-psychology, not anti-psychiatry, you know. I mean, you can observe stuff. Medicine doesn't stop at the shoulders. It goes up as well as down. So, you know, but I will say this. In America, we have an over-dependence upon external substances to solve our problem instead of the internal one that stands by always wanting to help. And David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And when David was in so much grief, he couldn't even look up. He felt the gentle hand of his loving Lord, look at verse 3, under his chin, lifting his head up. Boy, I've done that as a dad. I've seen the kids have something that was their most treasured Lego creation, and they're bringing it to show dad, and they trip and fall, and it... And they just burst into total, you know, dissolution of emotion. And I come down, and put my hand on their chin, and I say, you know what? It's okay. We'll build it again, it'll be even better. See, the Lord put his gentle hand under David's chin and lifted his head. Only the Lord can encourage us at the depth needed to heal a broken heart. Only the Lord can lift our heads when we're cast down. And David knew that. He sought that. He wanted that. He experienced that. So now in his saddest hour, as he's walking down from Jerusalem and up the mountain, he allows the Lord to lift his chin. And as he lays down to sleep, he allows the Lord to be a shield around him. Now you couldn't see, they're one of those things. You couldn't see the Lord's hand doing that. You couldn't see the Lord as a shield. But experiencing God took the truth by faith and believed it and held on to it. Sin always beats us down. God always lift us, lifts us up. Others may ignore us. God always answers our prayers. In other words, David said, Selah. Look at the end of that. Selah, verse 4. He has heard me from his holy hill. Stop and think about that. God always lifts. God always answers. That's why David said, hey, I'm going to be able to go to sleep tonight. Absalom's still alive. The army's still against me. Ahithophel's still counseling him. But I can go to sleep. Because the Lord lifted my chin, put a shield around me. Now, look at verse 5. And real quickly, I hope we can cover this. This is a theology of sleep. Some of you have never thought about sleep in a theological way. All of us, like David, need to sleep. Verses 5 through 8 discusses that. At the end of one of the most grievous days of his life, David rested in the Lord. He said, I lay down and slept, verse 5. I awoke. Why? Why? was able to sleep and wake up refreshed because the Lord sustained me. We should always think of sleep as a gift from God to help prepare us to start over again tomorrow. God wants us refreshed and renewed. It is also a picture of how much we need God. And sleep isn't just a picture of refreshment, renewal, and needing God. It's also a constant reminder to us of how we got saved. That's why I said a theology of sleep. Most of you have never thought about sleep probably theologically. It's an amazing truth to think about that. It's, it's wonderful as a picture of how much we need God, of how we receive his salvation. Sleep should decimate any pride we have in our own power or might and humble us to think how weak and needy we really are. But before I go into theology of sleep, it always reminds me of when I was in school. You know, all the students that, that uh, overslept and came into class late and had to face the ire of, you know, in college of the professor. And I remember I went to a Bible college and someone tried to, you know, make it spiritual. And they said, how come you're late? And they said, well, you know, I was, I was uh, with Dr. Sheets, uh, you know, at Bedside Baptist, uh, you know, the Church of the Inner Spring. Uh, you know, and they were just going on and on about that. And the teacher said, no, what you need is mind over mattress. And, uh, you know, that's, that is one way to look at it. But that's not what we're... We need to think deeply about why God designed sleep. Number one, sleep is not an accident. It isn't like we evolved to the point that, that now we need sleep or devolved. God designed sleep. 
God is the designer and promoter of sleep. As believers who look at life through the lens of the scripture, we need to see sleep. In fact, tonight, the majority of us are going to go to bed after this. A few hours from now, you'll be in, getting ready or in bed. And I want you to remember, if nothing else, this moment. God says, sleep causes you to have the signature of God written across your life. Why? Because when God designs something, it's very special, has a special purpose, and God wants us to know about it. Sleep means work has to stop. That's why people who never sleep and endlessly work are not getting the program God designed. Sleep means a day must end and our strength has been depleted and we need it renewed. Our minds have become weary. We have to be refreshed. Our bodies have gotten exhausted. We have to be restored. Sleep means we have limitations and we have to face our limitations. On a daily basis, we have to face a limitation. Sleep means that we have dependence that we must acknowledge and we must deny self-sufficiency. We are not sufficient in ourselves. We come to a point where we drop unconsciously into indefensible sleep. And that is so humbling, if you think about it. Now, one of the clearest reasons for sleep is to remind us of this truth. And the truth is, God is God, and we are not. We are helpless, limited, and dependent. God doesn't sleep. How is he described? I am the Lord thy God. I neither slumber nor sleep. That's God. We're not. We slumber. Some of you right now. And we sleep. Uh, a couple of you right now. You know, that's not all. Sleep is also one of the most beautiful reminders of what true saving faith looks like. In a few hours, when it's your time to sleep, think of what you will do. You end activities, you end conversations, you even end your consciousness of life around you as you lay the full weight of your body on an object that can hold you up. Usually it's a bed. But I have the cutest pictures. I can't, don't want to get on rabbit trails, but I just noticed there's this little hose in the drain leaking in the basement. I thought, boy, that's close to that box. We still haven't opened. I better move that box. So I carried the box upstairs and another box I'd never opened. When I opened it, it was all the pictures from 2007 through 2008. And on the top was one of one of our children with their head on something. And they had fallen asleep standing up with their head on the counter of, I don't remember, a table or something. It's the cutest picture. They're at church, too. It means they, they were with me and where I'm always staying longer talking with people. And, they, and someone in the church had taken the picture of them with their head on the table and their little Bible under their arm and they're wearing cowboy boots and they're sound asleep standing up. So whether it's a bed or what, we all have an object that holds us up. Now continue thinking about it. When you lay down, you must choose to completely trust something else other than yourself to hold you up when you're no longer able to take care of yourself. You know what that's called? Pure faith. Whether you thought about it or not, your couch or your roll away or your, you know, Rush Limbaugh select comfort air mattress, whatever it is, you are putting your faith completely in that object to hold you because you're unable to hold yourself up. That's a picture of faith. So sleep is when we relax fully because we no longer need to take care of ourselves. We are held up by something else and we give in to sleep. As one author so beautifully states, Throughout the night as you sleep, someone else is sustaining you. And this is a picture of what it's like to belong to Christ. Have you ever thought about that? The bed is sustaining us. The bed is protecting. Our covers are keeping us warm and, and offer a little comfort and, and cover. And we trust completely and are absolutely unconscious of what's going on around us. That's a picture of salvation with Christ holding us. We are held by someone else. When you crawl into your bed tonight, pause to remember as you entrust your body to be held securely through the night. Lift your heart in worship to the God who holds your soul in the sweet comfort where he said, if you are in Christ and God, nothing can get you. You are hidden with Christ in God. You and I are securely held with Christ in God. 
That's what sleep should remind a believer of every time we drift off into sleep, even here in church. Tell the Lord you are also resting your life in him. Whisper before you fall asleep that you completely need him, that you're going to trust his care. You ask him to get rid of any pride you may have built up throughout the day. That's the supreme peace David felt as he laid down in the presence of his enemies and slept in humble dependence on God. David learned a lesson. He could look fear in the face and go to sleep. Why? Because he knew he was on a battlefield and he trusted the Lord's promises. And he says, I'm going to lay me down and sleep just like I trust my soul to your eternal care. My body you can take care of too. And that's what he wants us to trust in too. Just before we go tonight, we have three minutes left. Why don't you take uh, your hymn books and look at number 43 with me? Because hymn 43 was written by that one that wrote that other great one I love. Uh, Living for Jesus, A Life That's True. Living for Jesus was written first. And it was, it was kind of like uh, Thomas Obadiah Chisholm's uh, confession that he was going to trust the Lord. He, he wrote about seven years later this one. It's kind of like the testimony that God can be trusted. The one who said, I'm going to, Jesus, Lord, Master, I give myself to you, seven years later said, wow, as I look back, great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There's no shadow of turning with thee. You change not. Your compassions, they fail not. As you have been, you forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. What a good way to end. And that's the capital L-O-R-D, the covenant-keeping God, that when you go to sleep tonight, Say, I've trusted my soul to you. Can you take care of all the other things too? And drop off like a rock. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I thank you that David could sleep in the presence of his fears and his enemies. And so can we. You have told us over and over and over again, fear not. Lord, tonight, let us roll our cares upon the Lord for you can sustain us. You are faithful, and we worship you now. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.